So, um, I'm Spencer Dawkins, and I think uh, Georg has kind of nudged me to starting the next session, which is on uh, transport. Um, just to, to say this out loud, uh, I'm one of the transport area directors at the IETF, and I'm thrilled when smart people show up to solve problems that I have. Um, so, thank you, thank you all in advance for the work that you uh, have done and continue to do. Uh, so, uh, first presentation we have up is one on, uh, on a uh, paper about a testing mechanism called uh, Copycat. Uh, presenter is uh, Corian, uh, and he is a PhD student at the university sorry, the research unit in networking at the University of Leash, working on middle box measurements and middle box impact on transport protocols. He's collaborating on the uh, EU H2020 measurement and architecture for middle box to internet, MAMI. Uh, prior to that, he was an intern at Semantic Research Labs at, at working on um, malware analysis. So, uh, turn over to you. Thanks for the introduction. So, I will present you this tool called Copycat that I'm at testing for differential treatment of new transport protocols in the wild. This is joint work between University of Liège and ETH Zurich. So let's say you want to deploy and test a new transport protocol of yours or a new extension to a transport protocol. What can you do? What choice do you have? You can either implement it within a network simulator and, to, and then run it whenever you want. You can run it in a control environment if you have access to any. And you can also run it in the wild between a few nodes that you have access to with the requirement of having to patch them so that they speak your protocol. What this tool introduces here is stateless testing. So basically, without having to implement your protocol on any node, you are able to observe how the paths react to the wire image of your protocol and infer any differential treatment in terms of connectivity or quality of service. So the idea is to run pairs of flows, one reference flow and one experimental flow. The reference flow will serve as the ground truth for the comparison and is a vanilla TCP flow that just transmits some data. Then the experimental flow can either be UDP or non-UDP based and is composed of two pairs of headers, inner headers or tunnel headers and outer headers. So the inner headers are vanilla TCP as well, and will be used to TCP control the flows. Then the outer headers can either be, so in the case of UDP, there's first a UDP header created by the dedicated socket, and then there's an optional extra header that can either be, for example, quick or plus. Then in the case of the non-UDP experimental uh, flow, you, are, you have the possibility to use whatever transport header that you want by defining it in row bytes. So, for example, you can use it to test DCCP, SCTP, or anything. Then the architecture of the tool is a very basic client server or um, receiver sender architecture. So first, uh, it will create a tune virtual network interface, which is simulation of a network layer device that operates at layer three. Then it will create two TCP sockets, binds one to the internet facing interface and one to the tune interface. Behind those sockets are basic uh, data writer readers. Then it will create a new DP or a socket depending on your choice of experimental flow, bind it to the internet facing interface. Then it will simply act as a tunnel endpoint by decapsulating any packets received from those sockets and writing it on the tune interface and reciprocally encapsulating anything read from the tune interface 
and forwarding it towards the internet. It also comes with a few features. You can uh, set up the flow scheduling to be so, so that the two flows are run parallelly or sequentially. You can choose a network layer, V4, V6, or you can even do the network layer battle. So in this case, it will run two pairs of flows instead of one. And the idea is to infer uh, differential treatment based on the network layer. So it will run two reference flows, one V4, one V6, and then two uh, experimental flows, one V4, one V6. And it works on few OS. So we tested this tool for the uh, UDP encapsulation for transport evolution use case. So basically just run the experimental flow to be uh, UDP with no extra header. We deployed it on Planet Labs and Digital Ocean, which is a cloud hosting solution. We run, we run it on a few ports. We run flows of different sizes calibrated from the TCP initial window so that uh, for the smallest flow, all data packet was sent as, uh, once, at once. And then we just collected the flow and analyzed them to infer any differential treatment. So first, in terms of blocking, so here in X's you have the clients uh, per continent, per country, and why is the servers? The color legend is the more red, the more UDP is more impaired than TCP. The more blue, the more, well, the opposite. So you have those two red lines, harder lines, which are the case of one node blocking all UDP traffic in both direction. Then, I don't know if you can see, but there are some black dots here, which are cases of TCP blocking as well. So this is probably an, an overloaded node. Still, uh, most TCP connectivity is good. Then there are also a lot of cases with no connectivity bias. So all the gray squares. And the third case are the transient connectivity problems, so the light shades of blue and red. But what is interesting here is that there are clearly line shapes. So this means that those problems are access network linked. Then the second thing that we looked is the throughput. So for this, we introduced this throughput bias metric, which is the relative difference between the UDP throughput and the TCP throughput. So here we plotted the distribution that we first separated between uh, low throughput and high throughput. So we can see for the plane lines that uh, low throughputs have, have few to no throughput bias. And when they have, it is balanced between better UDP and better TCP. In the case of high throughput on digital ocean, uh, there is more bias but it is balanced as well. Then in the case of Planet Lab, there is some sign of imbalancement on the uh, TCP is better side. So we looked at the location of those paths to investigate it more in depth. So here is a similar plot than the connectivity one. The legend is the same. Uh, red means TCP is better. Uh, blue means UDP is better. So we can clearly see that it is also access, access network based impairments. Then we looked at the initial latency. So we used uh, the RTT bias metric, which is similar to the throughput bias. Once again, we split the distribution at 50 milliseconds. So we can see that for uh, low latencies, there is once again few to no biases. For uh, high latencies on digital oceans, bias are balanced. And for Planet Lab, we see the same uh, sign of imbalancement on the TCP is better side. And this uh, explains at least partially the 
imbalance mode in throughput in the throughput bias. We also looked at the loss, but here there is not much to say because there is no substantial differences. So in summary, so this figure here is the summary of all the biases and connectivity black holes. So we investigated different cell treatment between TCP and UDP in terms of throughput, latency, and connectivity. We found that 2.6% of our probe were UDP blocked, and that most of those blocking happened to be access network based. So in those cases, if we were to use UDP as a substrate for transport protocol, it would require a fallback mechanism or some way to choose not to use UDP. And then uh, we saw, we observed that the latency and throughput biases are very small and access network based. This is the median column there. So in conclusion, we observed that UDP seemed to be a viable solution for transport evolution, only in the case where an alternative exists, and that most observed UDP impairment were access network linked, and that different kind of impairment were very rare. So if you want more about this, you can check out the code of the tool on GitHub, or the if you want to know more about the UDP use case, there is the technical report that is available. So you ready for questions? Yep. Excellent, please. I would invite people to ask questions. Um, I had a couple, but I will let people ask questions first. Vab <laughs> uh, to you, Munich. So clarification question. So what is the throughput and latency measurements done towards? So what it's is the distinction? It's full mesh between the nodes. So oh, okay. because we have to run we have to run the tool on on the nodes. So we choose to do it in full mesh between Planet Lab nodes and between digital ocean nodes. Um, so Planet Lab nodes are largely in research networks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the digital ocean nodes are largely in data set networks. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, is it possible that there is more UDP blocking in access networks, which is not uh, seen in this yes, study? Yes, probably. In different kind of networks, you can have different behaviors. So we have access to some SAMNOS probes, which are largely deployed at home. And perhaps, perhaps we can talk about this. Perhaps yeah. running this uh, tool from these SAMNOS probes, try to see yeah, that's, if that you see more uh, connectivity bias from access networks. Yeah. Hello. Uh, actually, to follow up on this question, how do you account for the bias of the plant lab node placement? <laughs> so, uh, are they distributed around the world, the 93 nodes you selected? Are they mostly in your university networks or? In other kinds of networks, so, or you are asking how we selected those nodes? Yes, exactly. So we took all available nodes on Planet Lab and se just selected one per sub network. Okay, not more than that. Thank you. Um, so hi, Corian. Um, I'm hi. also a, a co-author on this paper. Uh, so there's another. There's a few interesting data points that we have on the the. Um, UDP blocking, right? So there's this study found two point something percent, which is basically two point six, you know, two point six, which is that one line, right? Um, so that's a, a small enough sample size that you can't really say much about it. There was a ripe atlas study that we did, which was actually part of the bigger paper, um, so the archive paper that that you pointed to where we found about 3.5%. And I think we've, we presented that at MapRG um, a couple of MapRGs ago. And then the number that's been floating around, um, so that includes Rife Atlas probes, which do include some home access networks, 
but they tend to be biased toward people who know people who know people who are network geeks, right? So, <laughs> um, actually, that'd be a really interesting talk to do at a future MapRG or Matt in Ripe is sort of the the, the social network of Ripe Atlas hosts. <laughs> um, just, and I'm I'm actually halfway serious about that. Just to have it, just to be able to answer the bias question that always comes up every time you say I'm using Ripe Atlas for this. Um, what none of these. Um, and then there was the, the quick numbers. So the quick, uh, the quick walking numbers was about five percent, right? And that was mm -hmm. that was not that was taking the thing that um, that we're measuring here and conflating it also with the, with the blockage, right? So it was in five percent of cases, TCP was faster, right? So it's places where you have not just d deep red lines here, but also kind of reddish lines in the connectivity bias or in the in the RTT bias. Um, what none of these studies look at are enterprise networks. Right. Yep. There's not a whole lot of Chrome um, to YouTube on enterprise networks. Um, I mean, and there's, I haven't really seen any attempts to quantify um, how much we're missing there. Um, the Sam knows stuff is not going to give you a lot of enterprise network information. Uh, I'm guessing, are there any people who operate enterprise networks in this room? Oh, OK. Right. So having. It would be really interesting to find a way to have visibility into those networks that would not compromise sort of their business requirements, and that's a that I think is a really hard problem for this community to well solve. But I mean, think about first. So you have the uh, I just maybe just basically Brian has the opportunity to uh, the unique opportunity to throw a problem over the wall and then run around on the ITF side and catch it or on the IEB side and catch it. Good good job, guy. It didn't work. Um, but I, speaking for like so me as a transport area director, I think that's one of the spookiest things to me about all of this. Um, and I'm really interested not necessarily for people in this room, but I'm really interested in ideas on how to uh, get, get visibility to that. Randy Bush, IIJ. Our customers are enterprise. NTT does consumer. And you'd be surprised how similar they are. Um, but I just wanted to throw in one, the bias shown by route views and RIS and Atlas probes is officially known as the clue core. <laughs> <laughs> we hope that turns out to be unbiased, but we suspect it doesn't. <laughs> I point you back to Tim Griffin 10 years ago, measuring the bias of Planet Lab and the triangle inequality. And ta -ta 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 -ta. what we're measuring is what we're measuring. And that's it, boys and girls. Cool. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If there are not, they uh, the the questioners already asked the questions I was going to ask. So thank thank you so much and. So next up, we're talking about uh, tracking transport evolution, layer evolution with Path Spider. Uh, got uh, Piet. Um, is a born in Bel Belgium, where he also attended secondary school, has a bachelor's of science in electrical engineering from uh, Delft, University of Technology, currently in the final semester of his electrical engineering and information technology master's at ETH Surrey. Uh, outside of academia, also in involved in the hacker scene uh, by for example, by co-organizing OHM 2013 and Shaw uh, 2017. So, are you ready for her? So you good? Take it away. OK, um, good morning, everyone. Um, together with some people from uh, ITHA and University of Aberdeen, 
we've been looking into a tracking transport layer evolution with PodSpider. Um, and when you see this title, I think it really calls for two main questions. The first one is, why do you want to track transport layer evolution? And the second one is, what the hell is PodSpider? <laughs> so um, the answer to the first question, I think most of you will know, and it is that these days the internet is full and full and full of middle boxes. And they heavily interfere with our connections. Um, so if we want our services to keep working, transport protocols have to react on these interferences. And you could do that by some feeling in your left thumb or by some anecdotal evidences. But if you want to do it properly, then um, you really have to do that driven by data. So we've tried to collect this data um, through active internet measurement. And for that, we've built a tool chain of which PodSpider is the central component. And this tool chain can be used to run uh, controlled experiments against pretty much any protocol you'd want to measure and pretty much any target that you want to measure. And then um, the output of our measurements are what we call conditions. For example, uh, the condition ECN connectivity works that are associated with pods. So in this talk, we'll start by um, first looking at the basic architecture of PodSpider. So what does it do? And then also, how have we incorporated PodSpider into a cloud-based measurement system, um, a system that allows us to run many measurements, both over a long period of time to really track what is changing, and also many measurements um, together over a short period of time so we can eliminate transient effects. And then um, we'll actually look at, tr at three studies that we've done for three protocols with very different levels of deployments. That's uh, DSCP, ECN, and TFO. And for each of them, we have results and quite some interesting insights. So PodSpider is a tool um, for A-B testing of internet measurements and or of internet pod transparency. Um, and more specifically, what we want to look at is does using a certain protocol or a certain protocol feature impede on your um, connectivity? So how we do this is um, by opening two TCP connections. First, we open up a vanilla baseline TCP connection. And then quasi simultaneously with that uh, TCP connection with the protocol under test, we compare the results of these two connections. And based on that, we try to uh, deduce whether using the protocol under test actually impedes on connection or not. Um, so PodSpider uh, internally looks like this. You have a bunch of worker threads, typically about 50 or 200 or something, that um, all get their measurement targets from a large queue. They then um, synchronize with a configurator that ensures that your system is in the right state for the measurement you want to take. Um, for example, if you want to take an, uh, an ECN measurement for the baseline uh, measurements, the kernel should have ECN switched off. If you want to do your exper experimental measurement, it should have it switched on. This is system-wide, so everything needs to be synced up. Then they generate um, traffic to the test targets. And the data they have uh, on the connection, they send to what we call the merger. So this is typically the things like the five tuple, um, whether the connection failed or not, uh, basically what you get from your API calls. And then we have an observer thread that sniffs on all the test, uh, test traffic that's generated, also generates um, uh, records, for example, um, which flags were set in the TCP headers and so forth also sends this to the merger. The merger then figures out which, uh, uh, which records belong together, merges them together in one output, and that's the file that you actually look at. So um, this allows us to uh, figure out whether um, certain protocols impede on functionality, yes or no, but only from one location. Um, but in the internet, you, you typically have two places where impairments exist. Well, actually three. You have your access network, then um, you have impairments close to the target, and you have impairments close to the network core. But we measure from data centers, so we rule out the access network, so we're not very interested in that. Um, and you want to be able to distinguish between the two, because when you have a problem in the internet core, that's obviously way more troubling than when some idiot puts up a broken box somewhere uh, at his house. So um, how we distinguish by, uh, between these is by running multiple measurements simultaneously from different vantage points around the globe. Um, in our measurements, we've uh, used DigitalOcean data centers. 
And then we look at whether a connection with the protocol under test always fails, so from all vantage points, in which we say, okay, clearly there must be something close to the target that's broken, that's broken, and we say that this target exhibits side dependency, or whether it only sometimes fails and sometimes work, where clearly, depending on which path you track to, uh, take through the core, um, you get impairment or not, so we say there is path dependency. And then to make sure that we're not just measuring transients, we run every measurement also um, multiple times very close together in time, and only if we're really sure that every time we're seeing the same kind of uh, impairments, we say, okay, this is path or site dependent. Then, oh, then um, we've combined this into a cloud-based measurement system um, that has two uh, always up nodes. It has an orchestrator, which runs SaltStack, which is an open source and pretty awesome um, cloud provisioning system. And then a PTO, or a Path Transparency Observatory. So if you'd want to run your measurement, what you do is you um, SSH into the orchestrator, you set up your measurement campaign, and then the orchestrator will periodically spawn a bunch of measurements, uh, cloud nodes, run the measurements, and these measurements will then upload the raw data into the PTO. And then you also connect to the PTO and you set up what we call analyzers, um, which define how data should be processed. And then whenever new data is received, uh, the PTO will automatically process it and will populate it in a database for you. And then we have a nice front end that you can use, or a web front end that you can use to um, query for your results. So with the system, um, as I said, we run measurements on three different protocols. The first one that we're looking at today is um, DSCP, or Differentiated Services, which is um, part of the IP header. It gives you, I think, a six-bit field that you can use to tag packets into different service flows or whatever you want. Um, and this is quite often used by network operators internally. And then when the, net or when the packets leave their network, they'll bleach the fields. Um, however, related to uh, web inters uh, WebRTC, there have been proposals to also use this field to send data from end hosts to servers. Um, and the question that we're looking at is, does doing this impede on your functionality, yes or no? And then another question that we're looking at, which is more of a by the way thing, is, is there any link between the DSCP code points you get back from a server and the ones you sent? And ideally, there should be none. So how do we measure this? Well, um, PodSpider first will open up a regular TCP connection where you set the DSCP code point to zero, which is the default value. And then we open up uh, a second connection with a non-default DSCP code point. And then we see if the second connection fail, we assume that the SYN packet must be dropped. So something is impeding on our function or on our connection. So results. Um, Again, we've measured this from DigitalOcean. This is true for all the measurements. This is last time that I'll say it, I promise. Um, and we see that um, for the code point that we've used for testing, that's code point 46 or expedited forwarding, we see absolutely natural blocking. So if you look here in the table, see that uh, of all the successful connection attempts with the baseline case, only half a percent or so failed um, when using a non-standard DSCP code point. And of this half a percent, pretty much all of them um, exhibited some sort of path dependency. So there is almost no blocking, but the blocking there is is path dependent. And yes, we ran this on IPv6. <laughs> so um, then the second thing that we look up uh, looked at is um, is there any link between the DSCP co code points you get back and the ones you send out? Um, and as you can see here, the distribution when using um, the baseline case, so the zero code point outgoing or the 46 code point is almost identical. So there is no link, which is good. Second protocol is uh, TCP fast open or TFO. Um, TCP, uh, TFO is a protocol that allows you to, um, when you connect to a server uh, over TCP, exchange a cookie. And then if you connect again to that server, you can send it the cookie. And if the cookie is right, you can actually also already send data on the SYN packets. So you can basically cut round trip delay time or yeah, loading delay times by one round trip time. So um, again, for a measurement, first we open up a vanilla TCP connection. 
And then here we, um, we actually deviate a bit from our standard procedure um, because there is an API issue or was an API show, issue um, for the uh, TFO API. Um, we saw very, very long uh, timeouts when the connection failed. So in order to, uh, to, to avoid those, we only open up a, TF a TFO connection if this baseline connection actually succeeded. So first, um, we create our first uh, connection and we do a cookie exchange. And then we create observations whether this uh, cookie was received or was not received. Then if we did receive a cookie, um, we close the connection, we open up a new connection. Uh, we send the cookie, we send the data, and then we see was this data act, was it not act, or did the connection fail altogether? Results, um, well, we found that TFO, correct TFO implementations are still pretty much <laughs> limited to Google only. Um, and there's this one firm, it's here on the table, it has 14 IPs um, that actually responds with some non-standard TFO implementation, so they send a six byte cookie where everyone else sends an eight byte cookie. So they're also all linked to the same Spanish insurance company. <laughs> so I have no idea why they want to do that. <laughs> um, and we also see no pod dependency. But we only, because only pretty much only Google does this, and we have a very small set of, uh, of targets to measure against. So yeah, this, this has to be read with some care. Um, but this is actually in line with previous measurement or with previous findings that say that uh, TFO impairments is almost always in the access networks. So even though n is small, it still it still shows us what we would expect to see. Then uh, the third protocol that we looked at is ECN or explicit congestion notification. Um, this allows um, routers on a pod to signal congestion to end hosts without dropping packets. Um, so again, we do our usual yadi yadi. Uh, we open up a baseline TCP connection, and then quasi simultaneously we open a TCP connection where we try to negotiate ECN. We look, um, depending on which one of these connections work, we say that ECN connectivity is working, broken, transient, or the host is just offline. And then if ECN connection, uh, if the ECN connection is working, we will load the TCP connection a bit more, and we'll see if we receive any of the ECN code points. So we see whether we're actually also doing ECN after negotiating it. So results, um, we see that server-side ECN deployment keeps increasing, which is nice. Um, it also keeps increasing on V6, where before it was a bit flaky, it's now actually getting quite good. And uh, we also see that the impairments that, or after you negotiated ECN, there are still some impairments, but this, the level of impairments there is staying quite static over time. And then uh, another quite interesting thing that we did is we looked at um, hosts that showed ECN pod dependency and we applied geoanalysis on them, on them uh, via GRIP. And then what we saw was that the three countries that showed most ECN pod dependency, that's uh, China, South Korea, or North Korea and South Korea, um, basically are the three countries that apply the heaviest internet censorship, or of, of which we know that they apply very heavy internet censorship at the TCP level. Um, so this comes to show that if you try to break the internet, you actually break the internet. <laughs> and yeah, the, number, the numbers are actually quite staggering. So if we look at China, for example, uh, you see that about one in 500 hosts show pod dependency. And for the US, this is less than one in 10,000. And we think the reason that this happens is because um, firewalls like the Great Firewall are probably uh, very heterogeneous installations. So depending on which sensor, not bo sensor uh, ship box you hit, you get ECN or you don't get it. And you can also see here, um, the light purple lines show um, how stable the um, pod dependency is over time. And you see that it's actually not stable at all. So it's really based on, we think it's really based on luck which box you hit. And yeah. So in conclusion, um, we see that ECN brokenness is a good um, indicator for pod impairments at level three and four. Uh, this is because ECN uses both code code points in the TCP and IP headers. 
Um, and we see a strong correlation with ECN pod dependency and um, purposeful censorship. Um, we also see that TCP fast open stays very niche and that practically only Google's it, uh, Google uses it and that impairments are mainly access network linked. Uh, and then for DCP, we know that it's widely bleached, but we also know now that using it is not a connectivity risk. So um, if you want to learn more about this, you can uh, visit us on podspider.net. You can also fork us from GitHub, or if you just want to run your own awesome measurements, you can uh, just apt install podspider, and you can go. Thank you. Have we questions? We have questions. Excellent. Hi, Bob Vajpayee to you, Mining. I just wanted to say great talk, and uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, it would be nice to see how this evolves over time. It might be worthwhile doing it every now and then. Well, we actually, um, the plan is that with this cloud system we have, uh, we want to, it's not running at the moment because of logistical reasons. Um, is it? Oh, that's because his because fault. Brian is lazy. Because fine. Brian is lazy. <laughs> after, my <laughs> after my thesis, I actually voluntarily spent half a day setting it up again, and Brian didn't. So the runs. Oh, it runs. Yeah. So we have we just didn't analyze the data. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> You should say this in the microphone, so it's recorded. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> um, so once we get this back up and running, the idea behind this setup is that it actually uh, just keeps running. So your measurements start automatically, and your analysis starts automatically. And we have a web front end that will be public or is public. Um, so the idea is that this is a continuous thing, so you can really see how this evolves over time. Yeah. So I've I saw some indication that you, between your the first runs and the second runs in your experiments, your kind of baseline failure rate seems to have gone up. Have you any understanding of what that's depending on, even for without? Uh, do you remember on which slides or which? If you bring up the table for like the uh, ECN, for example, you. Uh, yeah. uh, Let's look at this one. So you see that like for IPv4, you still have, I don't know what's a significant number, but you still have, it's grow, going from 1.5 to 1.8 in the... So we run these measurements against uh, the Alexa top million or a derivative thereof. Yeah. Um, and our assumption is that there's just a lot of crap in the tail of that list. Okay. Okay, uh, yes, we should focus a bit on the IPv6. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's going down. Which... So, uh, yeah, for IPv6, we see that there's actually quite a significant increase because in 2016, June 2016, we had 11% uh, failures, and in January 2017, it was only four. And, and you have... It goes way up. Well, yeah, so we have four times the... Yes. Or almost three and a half times. So, those of you who spend way too much time on active measurement will remember in January 2017, Alexa decided that the um, top million websites list was a piece of intellectual property that they'd like to monetize. Um, and basically, the idea was if you wanted to run something against the top million, you should pay them about 2,000 USD per run. Um, and there was a ch chunk of about three weeks when we ran this test between not having an Alexa list that we could that we knew that we could legally do something with and um, Cisco opening the umbrella top million domains list, which has kind of replaced Alexa for, for these sort of things. So that January 2017 run runs a list that we cobbled together ourselves from other public sources um, that was meant to replace the Alexa top million list. So there is, in a couple of these cases, there we're not actually comparing apples and oranges. We're comparing, um, or we're not actually comparing apples and apples. We're comparing apples and plums, maybe. Um, 
they're related. Um, the, the trees look about the same, but there are some differences there that that can can change the coverage a little bit. Oh, thank you, Brian. Stephen Strauss, Ripe NCC. Following precisely on that point, um, the last time I checked, Alexa, we're still generating the top million. If you have the magic URL, you can go get it. They just, I guess, reserve the right to stop that. The magic that URL. The um, URL was actually also down for a week or two, three. Okay. It, Oh, I see. Okay, <laughs> now I get it. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, uh, I I want I just wanted to uh, thank you all, especially again for doing for doing this work that, about things that I worry about. Um, we we're having the conversation in a couple of IETF uh, working groups, which will be hopefully closing on this week about. Um, Opening up our ability to do more experiments with ECN, and so we're going to be, like I said, we're going to. Be, th this is interesting to us now, and I think it will be more interesting as we start, you know, exper you know, coming up with experiment after experiment with this. So um, I, I, I really appreciate uh, you all, you all doing this work. You know, I, I applaud good work, but I really like good work that makes my life easier, which this does. I think. Cool. Right, thanks. Any others? Thank you. Next. <laughs> <laughs>
in an ideal system below that value, all packets should be dropped. Above that value, all packets should be transmitted. And this, this value results from the combination of available capacity, amount of referred traffic, and the packet value composition of that of the traffic. And it's actually a pretty good descriptor of, of what happens in our system. And this complements end-to-end -end congestion control. We will show that it enforces fairness. Only low control loss has to be provided by the end-to-end -end congestion control, and, and only to avoid the dead packet problem. So if you have a single bottleneck, or if you have a network where that dead packet problem cannot happen, you can even live without congestion control. Of course, it's, it's a question what happens to, to your application then. And with this, even incompatible congestion controls can coexist in a network. So what are these throughput packet value functions? Uh, this is actually a derivative of the utility function, and it, it defines the desired throughput of a flow of a class for all congestion threshold values. So what, what is an example for that? We have three classes here, gold, silver, and background. So, and the horizontal lines are congestion threshold values. So in the most congested case, which is the highest congestion threshold value, we say that a silver flow should get four times the throughput of a background flow, and the gold flow should get two times the throughput of a silver flow. But we can, we can set throughput limits. So for example, we say, if a background flow reaches 100 kilobit per second, then this, this weighting should change. And for example, if a silver flow reaches one megabit per second, then this weighting should change again. So in this other congestion threshold value, when the system is less congested, we say that a background flow should get 100K, a silver flow should get one megabit per second, and the gold should get the rest. And, and after that, after gold gets already four meg, we, we change the weights between background silver and gold from four to two to 10 to four. And again, this is the throughput value function. This is only known at the packet marker. And from downwards the packet walk marker, these policies are communicated by packet marking only. And the resource node don't have to know anything about these policies, about the number of flows, only have to read these packet values. So how does a packet marker uh, look like? The requirement is that if, if all packets below a condition threshold value are dropped, then the throughput of the remaining packet shall be as defined by the TVF at this threshold. And it's fairly simple to, to imagine a simple packet marker, just quantize the function, make token buckets with the, the packet values and the, the, the length of the throughput region, and choose the token bucket with the highest PV where there are enough tokens. Um, a simple example for packet marking. This is a very simple TVF already quantized with four levels. And we have two sources. One is two megabit per second, other is six megabit per second. So you can see that uh, green is uh, about 200K, green plus uh, blue is about one meg, plus yellow is about four meg, and plus red is about 14 meg. So the two meg flow will only have yellow, blue, and green packets. So this is, this is time here. Why the other flow will have uh, uh, yellow and red also, but if you filter for the for the so filter out the yellow and the red packets, then the speed of both flows remain one megabit per second. This is this is again completely un unresponsive flows, and it's quite trivial. So because the marking rate of the blue plus green is one megabit per second, of course, if you have TCP and you, have, you filter out these packets, TCP will adapt, and there will be only a few incoming uh, uh, yellow packets, which will be immediately dropped in this congestion situation. OK, so as I, as I said, the task of the resource nodes within a network is to maximize the total transmitted value. So the simplest algorithm is to always serve the packets with the highest packet value first, which is not practical, because you want to keep ordering within flows, at least. So the second simplest in, uh, in concept algorithm is a uh, FIFO implementation, and then when the queue becomes fu full, drop the packet with the smallest packet value first. But still, uh, mid-queue dropping might not always be possible. So you, you have to have a uh, salt free, you have to be able to find and drop these packets. So we wanted to have a simpler algorithm, and that's, that's when we thought of pi. 
So what is Pi doing? Pi is basically having a controller, having a uh, current queuing delay and a target queuing delay, and using a controller to control a drop probability for the incoming packets for each incoming packet. <laughs> A random number is generated, and if, it's, if it is smaller than the, the drop probability, then that packet is dropped. And thereby, it maintains a, 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 the, the target get delay and the given queue length. It's, it's uh, quite well published in the literature. There are improvements to it as well. So how we can translate pi to, to the per packet value concept? What we do is that for each incoming packet, we maintain an empirical cumulative distribution function. So we, we basically make, for example, a histogram out of the incoming packets. We run the pi machinery. We calculate the dropping probability basically the same way as pi does. But instead of, of applying it directly and independently of the packet value, we, we take that value in the ECDF and update the congestion threshold filter accordingly. So if the packet value is larger than or equal to that filter, then we, we put that packet to the buffer, otherwise we drop it. And this is, this is in our implementation, it's a very simple and first step in, in implementing this ECDF. It's, we only implement it for the pi uh, control interval, it's 32 milliseconds in our simulations, and then we drop it. And, and we have seen some kind of like uh, oscillations in this uh, CTVs. So I, I, will, I will show that, and, and we actually at sometimes had to have, have had to increase the timing window for collecting this, this uh, ECDF because there weren't enough data. So this is this part when we, we, we translate the probabilities to filter values. It's definitely a, a point to improve and to, to get further ideas on. So we, we implemented this uh, algorithm in, in an simulator. We used Network Simulator Cradle to, to run a, a Linux cubic TCP implementation. We cho chose update periods to basically pi paper default 32 milliseconds. We had bottleneck rates ranging from 10 to 100 megabit per second. Target delays 40 and 20 milliseconds. I think we used 20 only because we wanted to compare to, to the Pi paper, which we used as a reference. And we had a propagation delay again 40 and 100 milliseconds, the second values again to, to be able to compare to the Pi paper. And we have uh, TCP users. They generated one or five TCP connections per flow, so a flow where we apply a, a throughput value function, so a flow has policies. So if in case the user had five TCP flows, these were handled together, even the packet marker didn't differentiate with, with them. We used five TCP flows because sometimes a single TCP flow wasn't aggressive enough or, a, or the drop of a single packet was, was too high and the resource sharing wasn't as, as we intended. And UDTP traffic is completely non-congestion controlled and high speed. Usually it's something like 60% of the bottleneck capacity. So if we have, uh, for example, three UDP flows as in simulations we have, they could already completely overwhelm the TCP flows if we wouldn't have any kind of resource sharing control solution. So this is the simplest simulation case. We have only gold and silver TCP uh, sources five TCP connections per flow, and we changed the number of flows from one, one, one gold, one silver, to two, two, four, four, and eight, eight. And, and using flow calculus and knowing the throughput value functions, it's possible to calculate the desired resource sharing. So what, what is what we defined? So if you know we have this number of sources, this TVF, TVFs, and this uh, capacity, then it's simple math to, to calculate the, the, these desired shares. And what you can see, if, if we have not too many users, there are some deviations from the from desired shares. But as the number of sources increases, the the actual share got by the users is very close to the to the desired. And this is mainly because uh, we we for for the one one user case. So this is this is the packet value filter versus the the time. 
So what you can see here is that in many cases when we had only one one users, we, we didn't actually have to put any packet losses because there was a burst of packet loss, TCP, it took time for the TCP flows, especially the gold TCP flows to again reach its desired share. And, and, and during that time, we didn't have any, any chance to, to do anything. And as the number of flows increases, we have more chances to, to drop the right packet, thereby TCPs adapt to the, to the right throughput. So again, the, the throughput results, so this, this was the region when, when it, it took time for the gold TCP flows to actually reach again the desired share. I also put the queue length here for this to, to compare to the prior results. So this was the desired queue length, and you can see that when we increased the number of sources, we increased at 30, 60, and 90 milliseconds. There was a, a spike in, in queuing delay, but otherwise it, it was like around the queuing delay pretty, pretty well. And at the end, I will compare it to, to the actual Pi implementation. It's very similar to Pi. Pi also has this overshot, larger or smaller. So if you want to, to be, for example, always below this queuing delay, then, then you, you need some kind of different algorithms. It was in, in, the, in the Pi target, I think it was mainly keeping this target, but going above it when it's, it's necessary. OK, next, next set of simulation results is with uh, non-congestion controlled UDP traffic. So the green flows here are UDP flows which can completely overwhelm the, the system. Um, we have three of them, and then at 30 milliseconds, we, we start having TCP flows, increase them from 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, and 4, 4. And, and what you can see is that, again, if we have not too many TCP flows, then uh, we are somewhat away from the desired share, but pretty close to them. And as we increase the number of flows, the flows get about the desired share, and also UDP gets smaller throughput as expected. So elaborating on this, I mean, what happens, for example, if we use PI in this case? If we use PI in this case, all packets are dropped with equal probability. So what will likely happen is that if, if you have like 10% or even, even higher probability of dropping TCP flows, TCP flows get basically no throughput by why the UDP flows get, get all of the capacity. And here, just by looking at the packet values and uh, getting the statistics, you can achieve a very, uh, a very similar uh, uh, system where the where the implementation complexity is very similar to that of Pi, but you can, you can stop misbehaving flows from grabbing too much. Um, one more simulation results with dynamic bottlenecks. In this case, we, we had, um, I think, yeah, one, one TCP flows one silver and one gold, and we change the capacity of the system. We change from 10 mag to 50 mag to 100 mag, back to 50, back to 10. We wanted to see what's the transient behavior of, of the system. And again, transients, especially ramping up transients, takes some time, but the system can realize the, the desired resource sharing pretty well. And, and in the final results I, I'm uh, uh, presenting, we wanted to compare it to the actual Pi resource sharing. So this scenario is as close to, to the scenario in the Pi paper as, as, as possible. So we have a 10 megabit per second button, like five uh, TCP flows, two UDP flows, and uh, the target delay and round trip time is, is like in the Pi paper. And we actually, in the paper, we have, a, we have a, another simulation results where we, we didn't reach the desired resource sharing as well as here. So what we did there is we increased the ECDF window. Again, ECDF window is how long you collect statistics about your packets to translate your dropping probability to congestion threshold value. So we had to increase that to, to actually reach this nice desired resource sharing here. And we also have to increase the number of TCP connections per flow. But if you take the, the values in the Pi paper, 
it was the two two classes get about the same capacity. Why we suspect there, there weren't throughput values in the pie paper, but what, what we suspect because of the equal dropping probability, TCP flows there were completely overhand. And it's even with the default, it's not completely overhand here. And if, if you tune some of the parameters, you can again approach the, the, the resource sharing quite well. So, and, and this is the Q length of the two algorithm. The, this one is, is from the Pi paper. This is from our paper. So we, we have a slightly larger overshot here. And after transient, it, it keeps the, the Q lengths very similarly. So in, in summary, we created the PVPi algorithm, which can govern resource sharing by combining the Pi and the per packet value concept. Drop probability is calculated by pi and is translated to congestion threshold value filter in, in the PPV concept. And this results a much more practical resource node implementation of or in this concept because the previous implementation had to drop mid-Q, which is often not possible. And using NS3 simulations, we have shown that it can realize the disorder resource sharing and keep the target queuing delay. Of course. We have some further work to do. We need further simplification. Actually, keeping the, the, the ECDF can be still quite costly, especially for high-speed links. Of course, there are other options, but we, we have to look into these options. And also, the, the filter thresholds has to be stabilized by, by also improving transient behavior. It's pretty OK right now if you have a few number of high-speed flows. This filter can, can be switched on and off fairly often, or if you have many UDP flows, there can be problems with it. Of course, Pi itself is uh, tuned for TCP flows, so it's not surprised that it's not, not behaving like perfectly for UDP flows. On the other hand, it's, it's actually somewhat surprising that it's, it's working that well with, with UDP non-congestion controlled flows. OK. And that concludes my presentations. Open for questions. So questions. Yeah, <clears throat> you actually mentioned my question already on the last on, on the last slide. I was wondering um, how much uh, computational complexity and state you actually need for the inverse uh, CDF, and how you maintain whatever the last window of values that, of measurement values you have. How, how how do you implement this in practice? Do you have or up to which speeds could you would you assume that you can maintain this? Just just curious. <laughs> I, I don't have a strong, strong assumption. I'm not quite the node implementation guy. In the simulator, of course, it's you can do whatever you want. The simulator doesn't matter, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's when it comes more. to practical implementations, we are thinking about actually practical implementations. I can't really go into, into many details. Of course, you can, you can always maintain a histogram and ra erase the histogram from time to time. You can qu quantize the value space or use smaller value space. We, we use the uh, single byte uh, value space here for the per packet value. So it's, it's not like amazing, uh, not, not like a huge value space. But we are actually, if you want to implement this concept like at its brightest, then you might want to use two octets. And, to, and having like uh, two octets, like uh, 60. Per flow, right? Hmm? Per flow, right? Or was no, no, no the histogram class. is per, uh, again. This was per class. No, this is per bottleneck. So again, I mean. The, the, the thing is with the concept is that at the resource node, you don't know about classes, you don't know about flows, you only know about, know about packet values. So you need a single ECDF per resource node. Then that is probably fine. So it's, 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 it's probably fine. It's, I mean, the, the whole thing with the concept is that scale wise with the number of flows because you don't know about the number of flows at all at the bottleneck. <laughs> all right, thanks. The question is in a similar context about flows, probably. Uh, so the idea, if, uh, let's say, my packets belong to the economy class, not the gold one, right? And I most preferred to be dropped, my packets to be dropped from the flow uh, because of this uh, of the mechanism. Uh, does, uh, does Pi also take into account the age of the flow? For example, assume if my flow packets are constantly dropped, their value will uh, start maybe increasing after some time, else my session will be ditched or will be impaired. Mm -hmm. uh, is the age a factor in this, for example, or? I mean, the, the, the thing is in the packet marking. So if, you're, if, you're, if your flow is responsive and your, your packets are completely uh, and uh, constantly dropped, 
then your flow rate will be likely below your, your fair share rate. Mm -hmm. And then the packet marking algorithm will make, make sure that your, all your packets has value higher than the congestion threshold value, which means that none of your packets will be dropped until you are above your fair share. So it compensates for the yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's compensated by, by, by packet marking. So let's say your fair share is 100 megabit per second, congestion threshold value is 100. Mm -hmm. And then as, as if you are transmitting with 99.9, .9, again, I'm talking about a completely ideal system, but then all your packets will have value higher than 100. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I wanted to, th I wanted to, uh, I, you know, someplace we have this this quote that you know to every to every problem there is a a solution that is um, obvious, simple, and always wrong. Um, and you, when I was when I was looking at your paper, where it's like you know, well, we have this tool, we have this other tool, we should put them together. And I was really worried that you were going to trip over the, you know, this is obviously the right thing to do. It's simple, and it's going to be obviously wrong. I'm really glad that it turned out as well as it did. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you. So this takes us to the demo part of our uh, of our presentation, and I will um, hand over the technology uh, to uh, the nice people from Neat. You going to do that one or? Yes. No, the, yeah, the, 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 yes. Yes. I was. I was. I was. I was gathering up everything. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you will need that or. No. Cool. I have no. No smart meters. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Felix Weinrank. I'm from the University of Applied Science Münster. And I would like to introduce you to uh, the Need Meet Firefox um, demo where we show a way how to browse the web in a neat way. So, first of all, what's the Need Library? The Need Library is a user library for network communication, which means um, you have a non blocking and callback based concept and a unified API for all network protocols. So you can use TCP, UDP, SCTP, SCTP in kernel and user land um, in the same way. No, different, no difference in how you use the API. And uh, the NEAT library runs on Linux, FreeBSD, NetBSD, and uh, Mac OS. And it's uh, libub based. And if you're interested in the project, um, visit needproject.org. There are some more uh, information about the library. So, um, what's the demo? Oh, sorry, missed this slide. Um, the need library is between the application and the, the network protocols like UDP, TCP, SCDP, and other protocols like um, WebRTC. We just added WebRTC support, and we have folks now working on WebRTC in the hackathon. So, we will present tomorrow a demo with, uh, Rod, um, with uh, WebRTC data channels and um, need lives between the application and the protocols. So uh, how does the setup look like? We have on the left-hand side, we have the client. Uh, we called it NeedFox because it's Firefox over Need. And the client is connected via two 10 megabit Ethernet uh, connections to um, two routers. And um, we call the routers Happy Blue Box. I will explain um, why we call them Happy Blue Box later. And here we have uh, two more 10 megabit Ethernet connections, which are connected to the server. The server runs THTPD. And uh, all these four networks um, have uh, live in different subnets. So this subnet is routed by this router to the other one. So two different paths. The NeedFox is uh, Firefox using Need, and we only support HTTP. Over TCP and over SCTP, 
SCTP means multi-homing. So we can uh, use several paths um, which are available. And Firefox over Need runs on Linux and FreeBSD. And it is possible to use uh, to be used on macOS too, um, but it's not running that stable. In our demo, we are using FreeBSD 11, and as I explained earlier, to network interfaces. The non-need component, Happy Blue Box. It's a router between a server and the client. It has dummy net running with a um, custom-made web GUI, and we are able to filter TCP, UDP, and SCTP on both paths, also based on FreeBSD. The server is a modified version of THCDPD, supporting TCP and SCTP, also running FreeBSD 11 stable, also to network interfaces. Um, the setup is located here. And uh, we will show a file download demo via HTTP2, uh, via HTTP, um, once running with TCP and once with SCTP. And the need library will check, okay, um, which pro network protocols are available on the path, for example, testing TCP and SCTP. Um, and it will try to use SCTP if uh, available because SCTP offers multi-homing and it should be two times faster. And if uh, the need library discovers, OK, we uh, can't get up connection with SCDP, uh, uh, there will be an automatic fallback to TCP. So set up again. Here's the client, which is this machine where the presentation is running on. And uh, this is the happy blue box stack. And uh, on the bottom, you have a Cisco switch between the laptop, which is not connected uh, today because um, it's not usable to uh, always switch the projector between two machines. There's uh, the Happy Blue Box router, and uh, here we have the uh, network server, which is this little box. This is the Happy Blue Box stack. This is the client. I hope this is going to work with this resolution. So this is the Happy Blue Box web interface. And currently, we allow TCP, UDP, and SCDP on all paths. And we will now block SCDP and switch to um, the virtual box machine, where we have uh, NeedFox running. So. There's over our HTTP over need, and if we check the connection, it says, okay, um, this website has been requested by this IP address, and it is using TCP. And if we start a file download, as expected, 1.1 megabyte per second, which is roughly 10 megabits, and it takes some time. I will stop it here. So we keep the browser open. So nothing will change on the uh, on the client side. We go over to the Happy Blue Box and allow TCP, uh, SCTP, in the virtual box machine again. I have not restarted the browser. Just rerun the connection test, and now we're using SCTP and. If we start a file download, same file again, we see it's using two paths and uh, we're reaching roughly the double amount of speed. So it's using SCTP um, load sharing over to network interfaces. This was our demo. <laughs> Uh, I hope we have questions besides mine, and I, uh, I will go last. I'm <clears throat> jumping in from Miria here. Why, why didn't it run by default over IPv6? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go turn, go turn I've not configured the uh, IPv6 <laughs> addresses. <laughs> no, no. What? <laughs> 
you see you see the serial cable when i just started the demo we have the uh, file system corrupted so i had to set up the system again and ah. next time i will be here with uh, ipv6 ipv6 only okay. and, and the nice part of that was that you didn't blame it on brian <laughs> <laughs> uh, questions? Hello, Eric Leutschmann. Um, the SCTP, is it CMT SCTP or is it plain SCTP? Um, it's, uh, it, you ask if it's a modified version or we have... Yeah. I know that for SCTP there's the concurrent multi transfer. Yes, form. it is. Okay, that's true. So you have to enable, uh, you have to set this uh, syscontrol option in FreeBSD to enable uh, the uh, load sharing. And, yeah. Thank you. Cool. Others? Uh, yeah, uh, cool work. Uh, besides the uh, proof of concept, what else, uh, what are other applications couldn't be possibly be done with that? How could other users use this for? Um, in need general need in general yeah. um, we have some other demo applications like uh, client app, um, command line um, tools and um, we are currently working on as I already said um, web RDC so and um, we are trying to to uh, bring up some other demos where we show the general purpose general usage of, of the need API um, we have, uh, for example, a web server which is supporting SCTP, TCP, web RTC, HTTP over web RTC. We're having some concepts, but yeah. Uh, and the motivation for that is to get rid of the middle boxes. I'm trying to see where you're coming from with this work because uh, to get. Uh, to you know, to do more tests and evolve. And I think Paul Hoffman from ICANN is doing some studies on the evolution of stack on the network. So I'm just trying to understand the real motivation behind it. Because I'm kind of behind like, the need project? Yeah. yeah. Um, to get a new API, um, to get rid of the socket API and to offer a unified API for network communication where you can seamlessly integrate new network protocols, like maybe in the future Quick or something else. And you don't have, the, don't, the application that developers don't have to uh, learn a new way to to communicate with the network depending on the network protocol. This was the main motivation and uh, NEED offers many uh, typical uh, network tasks like DNS resolution, buffering and uh, happy eyeballing. So testing which network protocol is available uh, when we try to communicate. NEED will try all the different combinations and you have a policy system where you simply say okay I want um, a secure uh, message oriented communication need do your best and then need comes up with a um, with an established connection and yeah choose the best protocol for you so if I was to in your your explanation of the motivation is of course correct um, the if I was going to talk about the meta motivation uh, how you you know how you end up in a place like this in the first in the in, in the first place um, so We've had this problem with coming up with deployable new transport protocols for a while. Um, and I, I've actually got a picture that I'm using in another presentation this week of, of uh, two, two, two feet with sneakers on and the laces are tied together. Um, but, it, you know, this, this is the, oh, we couldn't possibly change our operating system kernel because the, the, fire, the firewalls don't understand the new protocols. Oh, we couldn't possibly change our firewalls because why would we do that since nobody's implemented the new transport protocols, leather, rinse, repeat for, what, 15 or 20 years. Um, so we chartered a working group called TAPS to try to, you know, and so we're like, you know, we're going to start chewing on this at a number of levels. One of them was, well, you know, get the stuff out of the kernel space. So, you know, now you're in user land. Um, so, so that was, that was one thing, but, but um, the, you know, the other thing was, well, the applications, you know, they could come up and request SCTP, but they don't, you know, they come up and request TCP and that's what they request and that's what they get. And that's why. Nothing is interesting. So the you know the 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 the, the, 
the way we were treating this problem at that point was to come up and say, you know, what can we do to abs abstract transport so that you can say, well, you know, I wrote this with a certain set of, of transport characteristics in mind. TCP fulfills them, but that's not to say that other protocols couldn't. So that I can write my application against that abstraction and then good things will happen when you're able to jack up the protocol stack and run a new product transport protocol under it. Uh, that the things will, you know, as you as you guys showed with this, you know, they what he did with it, turning SCTP on and having that be preferred, that is what, you know, the transport community, as I understand it, has been hoping for for like 25 years. So uh, the, the TAPS working group that we chartered, uh, Aaron is around here someplace, for, three or four years ago, I'm trying to remember. Um, but uh, th that working group in the IETF was chartered to come up with kind of the descriptions of ways that people use transport and how that maps on to existing transport protocols. You know, you're kind of working back from that. Um, and this, this work is um, closely tied to uh, the TAPS working group in the IETF. But like I say, th this is a, this is a, uh, I, I think this is thrilling to me, and I'm not the most thrilled person about it. So, um, really, really, like I said, I'm really pleased to see um, where this is going. Um, that said, I got a couple of questions for you guys, and I guess you know, the the, the biggest the, the biggest one for me was um, when I was looking at the paper. I was kind of assuming that the the policy manager was going to be the most interesting and novel part of this. And uh, the, the paper didn't really discuss that, uh, the policy manager much that I saw. And I was curious if what you all had been thinking about that and, and uh, if you had any thoughts that you were able to share about that. Can you repeat the question? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so the, the short form of the question is, uh, I come up and I say, I want, I want something that does this and this and this. And I have, let's say in a happy world, six transport protocols that could do that. How do you, how does the policy manager make that decision about like what it tries and what it tries first and, and those, those kinds of things. And I, I recognize that this may not be something that you are prepared to talk about now because it wasn't really part of the paper and stuff like that. And that would be, that would be a fine answer, but you see, I'm just curious. Um, there are several ways to specify uh, which, network protocol or which applic which traffic um, you prefer. Uh, for example, you can be very precise saying, okay, I only want to allow TCP and SCTP, which we did in this demo, and um, you can add a preference. So you say, okay, I prefer SCTP, but if SCTP is not available, try TCP. So, and this is very specific way. And we Otherwise, you can say, okay, dear policy manager, I want to create a connection to Spencer and I want to be message oriented. Then um, the policy manager has these policies trying to build, um, yeah, to, to choose some suitable protocols. And the policy manager also um, remembers which. Oh, okay. okay. So Good. We, we have a history. Yeah. So um, we, we, have, we can make a clue saying, okay, last time, or well, last 10 times, we uh, talked to Spencer, we used TCP, and SCTP was not available. And, or for example, IPv6 was not available, only TCP over IPv4. And this is how the policy manager works. Need, it is possible to run need without the policy manager also. So if you don't want to run the policy manager, just leave it and run it without. It is possible, but the policy manager gives you a huge benefit. Yeah, yeah. And like I say, I, I, I'm, I don't think that that's a solved problem that you guys are just doing a demo on. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm very interested in kind of catching up with you on where you are now and, and I'm very interested in that work in the future. So cool. Um, Ms. Mr. Corey, do you have so, a thought? So Corey has a contributor to the whole thing <laughs> um, with several other people here. Um, another thing though about the policy manager, which we're working on the hackathon now, is feeding other sources into the policy manager. So that instead of just being able to use the transport, you can say, I want high throughput. And then you maybe get signaling from working interior for provisioning domains and discover that one particular interface supports high throughput. 
and then you can try and work out with your history information which transport protocols work. Does that interface actually support the transport protocol you want to use? And the, the space becomes a little bit wider than we previously had because yeah. the API is much, much higher. Um, a lot of this is kind of in the future. Once we built a system that can be flexible enough to do this, we can inject information into it. And I think this is the way to solve things like path MTU discovery or the huge amounts of heterogeneity we see around the network. How we do it? Well, maybe there's multiple ways. But I just thought I would kind of add that other dimension that's kind of, I think, useful. Yeah, I, I you know, like I say, speaking only for myself, whatever that mean, whatever that matter means right now. Um, but speaking only for myself, you know, it's like I think, you know, this is beautiful. What we're looking at now is beautiful, and oh, let's say multipath is beautiful, and so when you take this and multipath and I'm trying like I say I'm trying to understand how that works when you start when you start having more than n equals two of the different ways to uh, that you could get someplace that might work and uh, might have different characteristics and stuff like that you know if, if if n was six at each one of these levels would is that is that a good thing or a bad thing so but thank yeah but thank you Okay, I can mention that uh, on the ICCRG meeting on Monday, I will present some more that contains some information on the policy system. In e excellent, excellent. Thank you. Um, just a quick follow-up on Gori's point. So this is a kind of policy spider that you're then taking in multiple things from multiple places. But my question was actually, um, so this with the memory and so forth is all good, these are right now fixed nodes that are connected via Ethernet to some networks. So obviously, whatever you are doing is going to change rapidly the moment you have mobile nodes that are seeing yeah, various yeah, yeah. <laughs> widely differing networking environments of, of, depending on where they are, whom they connect to, who else is connected, and so forth. So, any I don't know any work any works along those lines in the making. Just just to give you a hard time. <laughs> So maybe you can bring up the picture of the architecture to say a bit more say a bit more about how the policy system works. So you have the the policy manager. So when the application makes its request, it goes into the policy manager that first makes a, a translation from some high level. If I ask for low latency, for instance, you have some. You have a policy information base that can map this to what it means in terms of protocols. Then there is a characteristics information base, and this is the part that has the dynamic information about the network. So this is what mentioned, Gori also mentioned, can be populated by different sources. So in Pairs' example, for instance, for the, for the mobile network, it will have information uh, gathered from the modems of the mobile network on the current uh, connection technology and, and measurements that you have. So this you can feed by different sources. So the policy manager can also use that information to select uh, and rank the different transport options. And then it creates a list of transport protocols with kind of a, a weight for each one or a preference. And that is what is sent into the happy eyeballs module. And happy eyeballs is then the mechanism that will try these uh, protocols with some time lag on them, depending on, on the ranking values that they have received from the policy system. And as part of the Happy Eyeballs module, when you get the knowledge about if this connection worked or not, as Felix was mentioning, then this is also cached back into one component of the characteristics information base. So the Happy Eyeballs is, is one of the sources for the SIB, but other sources can also populate that with the dynamic uh, information. So I think we will also talk about these issues in the TAPS session uh, in in the coming weeks. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I, you know, and just like I said, just for me, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, I think TAPS was the first working group I chartered as a new ID. And so I'm really thrilled that, that it would turn out to be the right thing to do. Um, there, there are a lot of things that ADs make, decisions that ADs make that, you know, you don't know, you don't ever know if it was the right thing to do or not, but that one, th this one's looking better as we go. So thank you all very much for that too. Um, anything else that we needed to talk about in here? In that case, I will hand the microphone back to Jorg.
Thanks again. Thank you. So we are in the in the luxurious position that, that the talks usually run shorter rather than longer, so that we have again fifteen minutes extra break time for talking to each other, um, <laughs> which is not bad. It's um, so, it is so unusual for transport people to not talk too much. I'm just saying it's unusual for academics too. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Another one of those Venn diagram intersection problems. Okay, I think we are doing a good job. So. Uh, we have some setup tables behind you, and then there is across the hallway, slightly to the right, a room where is there where there will be waiting a hot lunch buffet. I hope it will be waiting right now. We ordered it, I believe, for one, but usually if people are setting up early, so you can stay around here. You don't have to get lost in the hotel maze um, and just have lunch around here. We'll reconvene at two o'clock for the for the third session. Enjoy. Thank you.